So, welcome to the search for surprises. Um, apparently we're due to start at 9 o'clock in the morning, so I'm assuming it's slightly after 9 o'clock in the morning if you're on British time, and a bit later if you're on European time. For me, it's just after 7 o'clock in the evening a week or two ago, so um, expect the lighting to change a bit. Um, you can join this conversation on Twitter using those things you can see underneath, ES Confs and Workroom Prids. Uh, I'm likely to be online because, as I say, I'm not doing this now, I'm doing it before. Uh, time travelling complexity aside, let's move on to the talk. So this talk is called The Search for Surprises. What do I mean by the search for surprises? Um, if it's a surprise, can you even search for it? Um, I think surprises are interesting to us as testers. They tell us when our expectations have in some way been flouted. We as humans are capable of surprise. We are able to build a model of the world and without necessarily being able to describe or explain that model, we have an emotional reaction when something disagrees with it. We feel um, shocked. We feel doom, growing sense of foreboding, we feel uncertain, we feel frustrated, we feel confused. Those are our reactions to the real world, our reactions to what the world is doing. And I'm going to gather all those under this idea of surprise. And that, I think, is what we're looking for. As testers, we're looking for the emotional reaction that tells us when our internal model that we've somehow built, when that model is wrong. And that is why surprises are interesting for us as testers. Before I go any further, I should say that um, if you want to play along, we have a few toys for you at this web address, workingproductions.com slash esconfs. And you'll find some little things there to muck around with. So this talk is about surprises. It's about the way that we can be surprised by the systems that we make. It's about the way that surprises matter to us as testers and how we can translate that idea of things that matter to us as testers into something that's valuable for those around us at work. Now, surprise is kind of a nice word. Um, here we've got a lovely box. It's been wrapped up. It's got a red bow on it. It's a surprise. It's a delight. We're very pleased by that. Um, obviously, uh, it's a bit too small as an analogy, but those of you who've seen Seven will know that not all surprises that come in nice boxes are nice surprises. Sometimes surprise means trouble. A surprise can be an unpleasant surprise. Let's rewind. An unpleasant, a surprise can be an unpleasant surprise or a pleasant surprise. That means that it is, if you like, pre-judgment. A surprise is to do with an observation that we've made, something that we've noticed. Maybe we triggered it, maybe we've just noticed it. And that causes a reaction in us without it necessarily causing us to think this is terrible or this is great. Um, we reveal a risk. Now, we build complicated things, and we build complicated things to deal with our complicated world. And what we, the reason we build these complicated things to deal with our complicated world is that we have access to extraordinary golems. We, our computers are very fast, very accurate, very capable, very stupid. And we take these fast, accurate, capable, super extraordinary, stupid things and we try to put them all into a shape where they can help. Now it's hard satisfying the needs of our complicated word, word, blah, 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 complicated world. It's hard satisfying the needs of our complicated world with lots of swift and stupid activity. So why then is surprise important? We know that we're going to be surprised by the things that we build. What well, matters about surprise? Um, I'm going to read a book, uh, which is just what you do when you're trying to be interactive on a webinar. Uh, I'm going to read. I'll read it out loud so it's not too dull. Uh, this is a book by somebody called Horace Judson. Horace Judson wrote a book called The Search for Solutions. You know, it's the parallel there. And in this, he's quoting Lewis Thomas. Um, 
One might also quote Louis Pasteur, who said, in the field of observation, chance favours only the prepared mind. Um, I don't know that we operate only in the field of observation. I think sometimes the prepared mind can be so prepared that it fails to notice some surprises. But let me read uh, a longer quote. This is from somebody called Lewis Thomas, who at the time was president of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. So uh, we don't really know who he was, but he's serious, let's say. What he says is something that I was, I was rather fond of when I wrote. Um, I don't like the notion of serendipity as much as I used to. It seems to me now that if you get the research going, if you move away from speculating and making up hypotheses and actually go to work on the problem in the laboratory, then things are bound to begin happening if you've got your wits about you. You create the lucky accidents. Every now and then, something turns up in the course of exploration that's worth, as the guidebooks say about restaurants, a detour. I think that's when really important observations are made. And I think one way to tell when something important is going on is by laughter. It seems to me that whenever I've been around a laboratory at a time when something very interesting has happened, it has at first seemed to be quite funny. There's laughter connected with the surprise. And whenever you can hear laughter and somebody saying, but that's preposterous, you can tell that things are going well and something probably worth looking into has begun to happen in the lab. Now, as it happens, uh, I've been ticked off a couple of times for having teams that laugh too much. And... Um, I hope that's at least in part because they were frequently surprised by what they found in the software they were testing. Um, to an extent, I'd like them to have kept their laughter themselves because um, overdoing the delight at somebody else's failure is not the best way to get on with the world. However, I think that when you see something that takes that emotional hit, so that causes that emotional hit, that makes you think, that's interesting that's fascinating, that's delightful, then that's the real world talking to you. And the emotions are there because the real world has told you that you're wrong and you're dealing with that. Let's see what this perhaps means for us as testers. Now, we kind of know how this is going to go. This is diagram one of software engineering. You divide the world into what you expect and what you don't expect. And <coughs> excuse me, you try to make the thing that you're getting, your deliverable, match that as closely as possible. That's what the software engineering is about. We know that it doesn't work like that. We know that frequently the thing you expect and the thing you have delivered don't quite match. They don't match. So you've started off by dividing the word into world into two parts. You say, this is what we expect. And you work through your expectations. And you work through your expectations because what the hell, if you work through the black bit, everything that you don't expect, that would take too long. So we work through our expectations. And what do we find? Well, some of the time we find that what we expected was indeed delivered. We've asked for something, we get it, that seems valuable. And sometimes we find that what we expected was not delivered. We asked for something, we didn't get it, we've invested something, time or money, we failed to get something back. Value has not been delivered. You will notice that the world is not divided simply into two parts anymore, but you introduce the deliverable and it's divided into four. Um, now, we don't know where these bits are. We don't know where the edges are. We, we perhaps know how, how to work through our deliverable as well as how to work through our expectations. If we work through our deliverable, we get different stuff. Sometimes as we work through what is delivered to us, we find that it matches our expectations. And sometimes as we work through what we have delivered to us, we find that it does something unexpected. Now, finding that the thing we've got does something unexpected because we're working through our deliverable is different from finding that it doesn't do what we expect. And this extra part, as we work through our deliverable, we find out about stuff that it does do that we didn't expect. Those are surprises. We don't know if they're problems yet or not. We have to apply our judgment. But let's be frank about this. The system doesn't care about what we expected. The system is what it is. 
And as you work through the deliverable, as you work through this thing that is what it is, you're finding out, we hope, the truth about it. This area that you can see where something is delivered but unexpected is real and true and exists. Now, I don't particularly care what you call that kind of testing, but my feeling is that if you're not looking for surprises, you're not really looking. And I'm outraged by organisations that I go to who say things like, we're not doing negative testing, we're not going to look for problems, and if we do find a problem, well, we'll deal with it if we can, but we'll keep it very quiet from our customers and end users. That outrages me. That's not to say that's an invalid strategy, that's to say it outrages me. I find it hard to work in those places. So, we can work through our expectations or we can work through our deliverables. And as we work through our deliverable, we find things that are unexpected. We find surprises. Again, the reason we work through our deliverable is that we definitely don't want to be working in that great black area that says this is neither what was delivered nor what was expected. But we do have something else to work through other than simply our expectations. I hear people talk about a spectrum between exploratory and scripted testing, which is kind of what we're talking about here. And you hear people talk about things like best practices or agile methods and what things are best for. Uh, you hear the weasel words of um, formal and informal and... Um, Frankly, I've not worn a tie to a wedding for a few years now, so I'm not convinced I know what formal genuinely means. Um, but let me tell you what I think it means for me here. If we're looking for surprises, we can think about this continuum in two ways. We've got, well, we can think about this continuum in terms of feedback. When I talk to Agile guys, and when I talk to people who've written a lot of unit tests, they talk about feedback in terms of the speed of executing the tests and getting the result back. I'm going to talk about a different feedback loop, the feedback between designing the tests and getting the result back. If I design the test and run it once, and then run it again in an hour, and again in five hours, and again in a hundred hours, and again as the product gets towards maturity, I've written something designed for slow feedback. If I write a test, find out what it does, and then write another test based on the last one, I'm using very fast feedback between designing and result because I don't know what my next, my next design is going to be until I've got that result. And so you get these two sets of tests. One with slow feedback between test design and generally multiple test execution that tells us about value and you've got another kind of testing, and there's, this, uh, actually, there's a spectrum between these, which uses very swift feedback between design and execution, and then redesign again, that tells us more about risk. Now we want value to persist, so we're gonna keep on running those tests. We want risk to go away. We might run the test more than once. We might try things out to see if that risk has gone away. We might then change that into something where we see value, but that, for me, is the difference between what people call scripted and what people call exploratory testing. Now, one of the problems of this is that, or one of the problems of this idea of fast and slow feedback, is that people can get very stuck into confirmatory testing. If all your testing tells you is that your expectations are met, I don't care how fast or how frequently they run, you are missing out one half of that two-circle diagram. You're missing out the bit where you move through the deliverable to find out what it really does. You're still working from your expectations. Um, this is time for a brief digression into the work of Solomon Ash. Solomon Ash took 12 people and he put them into a room and he had previously persuaded 11 of those people to do a strange thing. He asked everybody which was the longest line. And under some circumstances, 11 of those people picked the shortest line. What did that do to the remaining person? Very frequently, the remaining person also picked the wrong line. And this is something that has been repeated, I believe. I've never seen the experiment myself. I've read a few papers about it. Um, 
The second part of the experiment is perhaps more interesting. He persuaded, of these 12 people, he persuaded 11 of them to obey him. And those 11, 10 picked the longest line when asked for the shortest, and the shortest line when asked for the longest, and one picked the correct one. In that circumstance, with the dissenting voice, the person who had not been persuaded, the person who didn't know what was going on, always picked correctly. A dissenting voice can make all the difference in terms of whether peer pressure gets you to something that is accurate and reasonable, or whether it scoots you off in a strange direction. So, when I look at teams that are doing only confirmatory testing, when I look at teams that say, we really don't want to find problems here, I feel the need to occasionally be the dissenting voice, to see what else turns up. And one of the ways to do that is to find the truth of the system by scanning through the system itself. Massive confirmatory tests are very attractive, but they aim us down one particular path. So with that in mind, let's look at a few examples of uh, moving through the system to find out exactly what it really does. Um, so first, here's a toy to play with, and then a few examples that I recorded earlier for you to watch if you're not playing with the toy. This tells you um, which, ge which geological era you're in, not geographical era, clearly, um, which geological era you're in, um, depending on how many million years ago you think you might be. So, um, this is a slider. You can move it up and down, and when you move it up and down, it changes this number and tells you a different thing. Now I'm I'm interested to know how you're going to go around go about testing this. Um, I might suggest that you could drag this up and down and you could see where the name changes, Triassic to Jurassic. You can perhaps refine that. You can say, okay, uh, where does it change from Triassic to Jurassic? Is that around the right place? I, you might find a way of making it more precise. Um, particularly if I tell you that you can change that. So um, off you go. Have a, have a look at that. Have a play with it while I'm talking about these other things. And we'll come back to that later and we'll talk about um, all sorts of different, well, we'll talk about a few different ways that one can search through this and find a few surprises perhaps. So let's leave that to one side for a moment. So on to an interesting surprise that I had. Um, I have some software that I build for a workshop. The workshop's called Getting a Grip on Exploratory Testing. I tend to teach it at corporate clients. I occasionally teach it in public. And in a few weeks' time, I'm teaching all, an all-new version at Eurostar. I found a few weeks ago that what I thought I had coded worked differently from the way I thought it worked. Specifically, I coded a field to have a whitelist. Let me show you what I mean. Here is my machine and I can type in numbers and I can even type in a decimal point. And that's because I've whitelisted numbers. I've allowed numbers and as it happens decimal points. Because this is a machine for a testing class I've also whitelisted a few other things. So for instance you can put in a pound sign. And my whitelist works. If I put in numbers, so letters, you can't see, but I'm typing on my keyboard. Nothing goes in. Um, specifically, let's try a star. Star doesn't go in either. Now, let's go over to the same code base. This, absolutely the same, just with a different compiler. Oops, into there. Same thing. And I think I can type in one, two, three, and a dot and a pound sign, and that's fine. And if I go across the letters, well, you can see I've got a semicolon there. I don't have any actual letters, but I've got some extra bits and pieces. Remember the last time I specifically typed in a star? Well, there's me typing in a star. So although I've written this thing to be a whitelist, and although it's explicit about what it should allow through, part of the whitelist is just not working on this compiler. The code is the same. It explicitly says what characters to allow. 
So obviously I go off to investigate. This is a surprise that catches my attention. Let me show you how I'd investigate. I've got a file that contains a whole bunch of ASCII characters. There's my file with a whole bunch of ASCII characters. We'll copy out some of the visible ones and we'll throw them in. This is thrown into the version of this machine compiled with an old compiler. We notice it's got all the numbers in it, a bit of punctuation, a couple of currency symbols up the front, well, a bit more punctuation, and a currency symbol. Let's try exactly the same thing pasted in to the code, the same code compiled under a new compiler. And that's not quite what I'd expect. It certainly has the currency in there, but it's got a whole bunch of new punctuation that I wasn't expecting, squiggly brackets, square brackets, a star, an at sign, and up the front here it's got even more punctuation. So an exclamation mark and so on there. Here we've got hash signs, stars, brackets, all sorts of stuff. So that was that was my problem and that was how I looked into it. Let me just flip back to my presentation for a moment. I pasted in a range to get the ASCII set out. The old compiler gave me that, the new compiler gave me that. Um, those of you with an eye for detail will notice that uh, what I've got here from the new compiler is different to what I had on screen. And that's because, in another surprise, it turns out not just the compiler but also the operating system matters to this. So the surprise is an unexpected dependency, a dependency on the compiler and dependency on the operating system, neither of which I would necessarily have expected when I wrote it, both of which I assumed foolishly would be working just fine in the later versions, given that I hadn't changed anything of the code. That was my surprise with my own code. There we are. There's the difference with the new operating system. So what does this surprise tell us? Well, specifically, it told me that with this technology, I can't expect the functionality of what I write to stay the same if I make a major change to my operating system and my browser. And that the likely changes are things that I can't anticipate. Let's look at another surprise and see what it told me. Um, this is a website for a commercial company, you'll probably recognize it, and I've just tried to get my account details from this organization. Um, let's see what the problem is. Those of you sharp eyes have already spotted that there are a pair of null pointer exceptions where you would perhaps expect to see your account details. Now, it's a surprise to see this. I've been told that this is a user interface problem, and it might be. But let me just digress to user interface problems. I'm a user, so lots of the surprises that I see turn up in the user interface because it's the interface I use as a user. It doesn't make it a user interface bug. The user interface isn't what I'm looking for bugs in, it's what I'm looking for bugs through. And if I look through this, what do I see? Well, I see that a message that has come out of the Java Virtual Machine has been interpreted as user-facing text to be put on, or perhaps user-facing HTML, to be put onto a screen in front of me. It's not been caught. It's not simply that the error hasn't been caught that created an L pointer exception. It's that the text produced by that error hasn't been caught. I can surmise, perhaps, that whoever wrote this would be surprised to see this, because surely if they weren't surprised to see this, they wouldn't have let this go through. They would have checked to see, well, have I been given a null pointer exception? Text that tells me this is a null pointer exception. So the surprise there tells me perhaps about what the designers expected this to be able to do. So finally, let's have a look at a, a surprise that turned up under OS X. Um, this is text edit. 
I found this first off in um, what was it? Snow Leopard. So a couple of versions ago, I recently changed over to Mountain Lion and found that it was still there. Um, let's let me put that in now. I've typed in contact sand. You'll notice I have a bunch of red dots under contact. The sharp-eyed amongst you will notice that those dots have been very poorly anti-aliased. And there's a couple of really quite strange bugs here. I'm just zooming in. You'll notice how hard that is to do. Um, so not only have I got these funny bugs, funny dots, that's a bit of a distraction. I've got the dots at all. Those dots are telling me that contact is a spelling mistake. Let's do this again. Contact is not a spelling mistake there. It's not a spelling mistake when I complete the word. It's not a spelling mistake when I type in san. When I type in sand, it pauses for a moment and says it is a spelling mistake. It's taken these two words, and I don't recognise this word, but it tells me that this one is the mistake. Now we can ask it what it thinks it should be. K for contact or K for contant one or the other. What is going on there? Let's have a look in spelling and grammar. Let's show spelling and grammar there. Um, it should be one of those two, it reckons. Um, now, I notice that currently we're, the spelling is set to automatic by language, and there are a lot of languages under there. It doesn't tell me what language it's, it imagines that I've misspelled contact in. So it's made a decision. And this surprise tells me about something that's going on under the hood in OS X. Under the hood in OS X, it decides what language you're working in. And having made that decision, it goes off to find a, di to find a dictionary. Indeed, the reason that I know that it's deciding what language I'm in is that it has gone off to find a dictionary because it must have found a dictionary before deciding that something was a spelling mistake. OS X, then makes a decision about, uh, let me just get rid of this, OS X makes a decision about what language you're in based on really very little. And I'm not sure that that's a great thing to base it on. Uh, let me change that. So if I change that, suddenly it's not a spelling mistake anymore. What language are we in then? We don't, I just don't know. But it seems to think that I'm in another language. I've just changed that to Santos, and suddenly it thinks that I'm in perhaps Spanish. So it is changing the language that it recognises that I'm in. And now I've got the same as I had before, but it still reckons I'm in Spanish. That surprise tells me that there's something much deeper going on here than I would normally have expected. It is making a decision about what language I'm working in, and it's making that based on very few cues. And we're not surprised that it's getting the wrong language. What I'm surprised by is that it's choosing to decide at all. So this surprise, that contact is a spelling mistake that was in something beginning with a K and now is a spelling mistake in Spanish, uh, that tells me that OS X decides what language it's working in based on very few clues. So there are a group of surprises and um, I've tried to give you an idea of not simply how I found them because I tend to be surprised by them. I wasn't looking for them directly, but how I reacted to those surprises, how I investigated them, what conclusions those surprises led me to, how I am able to develop my knowledge and my judgment following from the evidence that I see in front of me, not necessarily from my expectations of what the system ought to do, but from the truth of what the system actually does. Some of you will want to know more than just examples of what I thought I did, uh, replayed for a video. Um, some of you will want principles and ideas. Now, there are lots of different ways of exploring a system, just as there are lots of different ways of exploring expectations. And I think for me, the key part is that there's lots of different ways. Difference is crucial. Here's something else I prepared earlier. So I want to talk about how one deals with finding surprises. Now there's lots of different approaches, but perhaps the most interesting part is not approaches, but different. If I say there's lots of different approaches, different is important. Um, how important is it? Well, I made a model of 
testing. It's not a terribly good model. It's an illustrative model. Uh, it allows me to change a few things and to run a few experiments, and I hope those experiments will be illustrative for you. You can play along with these if you want to. They're on my website. Um, so I imagined that if we were looking for things, and they could be coins buried under trees, or they could be bugs, that we had a fixed set of things we could find. And I know that that means we're rarefying bugs, but bear with me for a bit. Imagine that we had a fixed set of things to find. Some things would be easy to find, some things would be hard to find. Um, in my model I also say that some are very costly and most are not costly. We have a budget. We have a budget that we can spend. Now, some things are easy to find and some things are harder. How much budget do you spend? Well, it's kind of an abstract question, isn't it? But let's make it a bit more tangible. This is... Uh, a simulation of one tester using one tactic. Now, this tester has got some thousands of bugs to find. I think he's got two and a half thousand. He's got a budget of 1,200 whatevers. He's going to find all the easy stuff first because he's using just one tactic. Let's run this for a little bit. Let's go just go just run it through for a bit. So, of the two and a half thousand things to find. He's found getting on for a thousand of them and he's only and he's worked fifty whatevers. He's finding things pretty fast at the moment. So he's found things, he's used just one tactic, and he's found them at a rate of a uh, thousand having done fifty work. Let's do another fifty work. Another 50 work. Well, he's certainly not found another thousand. He's found another couple of hundred. Now he's done a hundred plus work. Let's do another hundred work. He's finding fewer and fewer as time goes on. Let's just let this spiral out to the end. It'll take a little while. I hope that you feel able to follow along. You can play with these to your heart's content. Uh, they're all on that site that I gave you. It's worth saying that these are controlled by an XML file. If you want to run your own simulations, just flip open the XML file and change stuff. You can see, as we go, that this one tester really isn't finding things very well. He's found all the things that are easy to find, and now he's finding one or two rarely. We'll run him all the way to the end of his budget, He's found one very big thing, that's why a great big yellow blob is set in the background there, but actually he's missed an awful lot, because those things are really hard to find. It's no great surprise. Now, you might think that the approach to try with this is to say, let's try having more testers. If all your testers take the same tactic, you get the work done faster. But you don't actually find any more things because your testers are all taking the same approach. The things that the bugs that were hard to find for one tester are hard to find for six testers if they're all taking the same approach. Let's try something else. Here we've got six testers and this time they all take different approaches. Now, as it happens, this is mathematically different, different. It's not a little bit different, this is a lot different. So a bug that is easy to find in one might be easy to find or might be difficult to find in another tactic. They are entirely different. Let's see how that looks. Six testers, each taking different each taking a different approach, so what's easy to find to one would be hard to find for another and vice versa. It's palpably faster from the off, of course. We started with two and a half thousand things to find. <coughs> we found pretty much all of them. Uh, we found pretty much all of them pretty quickly as well. There we are. Um, so if we spend our thousand, we found a whole chunk. That's 2,400 or so. If we drive that all the way down to the end, we'll find a few more. So for me, that illustrates that using this model and thinking about whether you're using one tactic or many, um, it's much better to have a diverse collection of approaches than to take one monotonic approach because those 
things that are hard to find in one monotonic approach will remain hard to find, whereas if you're taking different approaches, you might find them more easy with a different approach. There's a further question, which is about switching. Here we have back to our same tester again. Now, she has a different approach. She doesn't use one tactic. She's got ten tactics. As it happens, she switches between them randomly. And every time she switches, her skill goes back down to nothing. So she's not very well advantaged. She's not doing anything conscious here to look for more problems. Let's see how she does. Remember that she's working on her own rather than six, so it looks slower than the previous. But here we've spent 250. We've found an awful lot of stuff still, even though we're switching between different techniques randomly. Let's run it towards the end of the budget. Well, although we're still finding ones and twos, that jumps occasionally when she changes tactic, even though you'll see that her skill drops to very little. And as we get to halfway through our budget, a little bit lower now, we can see that with that same budget, we found just as many problems as the six testers with six individual tactics had last time. Diversity is really crucial when it comes to testing. And perhaps diversity, even exercised in this way, which is without thought, and without aim, simply changing at random and in a relatively disadvantageous circumstance, um, perhaps we find that a diverse approach, even a randomly changing diverse approach, is just as powerful as a, an approach with many more people involved. Um, you can try these things out. You'll find you have different numbers because this is always randomly generated. I'm more than happy to share some of the insides of these with you if you want to look a bit deeper. Um, so for me, that's my illustration. that We really need a whole bunch of diversity in order to go out and search well for bugs. That said, let's have a look back at the million years exercise and see what kind of things we can find. So let's go back to the million years ago thing. Now, what have we got? Well, we've got one input area and we've got another input area and we can use those together to refine. We can get down to some binary uh, searches. Uh, what have we got? Jurassic to Triassic. Jurassic, Triassic 203, Jurassic 199. Let's try those as round numbers. 203, Triassic 199, Jurassic. Okay. So um, we can go halfway between those two, 199 to 203. So we go for 2015. Triassic. Let's go for 200. Jurassic. Um, I'm going to assume that the difference between Jurassic and Triassic is that they've decided to make a nice round number. So let's go for 201. Okay. 201. Jurassic. Mm hmm. 201.5 Triassic. So I'm searching my way through, not using a not terribly efficient approach to binary search, but one that I can actually do while talking at the same time. And I now know that the difference between the Triassic and the Jurassic is somewhere between 201.5 and 202 million years ago. That pretty much fits. Let's see if we can find it more exactly. 201.8, 201.9, 202, 201.5, 201.5. 3, 201.1, 201.2, 201.25, 201.29, 201.3. So 201.3 is the cutoff for the, the Triassic Jurassic. We know where the Triassic Jurassic boundary is now. Uh, we can check that against what we would expect. And we've done our binary search. Now we notice that we can type in numbers. But the tester in me wants to type in a smaller number. Now, I can't get to one using that. Oh, yes, I can. So I can get to one using that. Well, can I get to any less? One million years ago was during the Pleistocene era. A thousand years ago, million years ago was during the, during the Protozoic. Can I go further? Two thousand years ago? Two thousand million years ago? Yes. Can I go for it's about the age of the Earth? The Hadean era? Uh, Oh, 
Well, that doesn't look right, does it? I by, by mistake, I typed in an extra dot. I seem to have something there. Now, I can't get to this, but it looks as though there's something that's selecting. Yeah. The pre-solar system era. 10 billion years ago. During the pre-solar system era. Uh, 20 billion years ago. During the uh, era. Hmm. Okay, so it's not dealing well with large numbers. And the question now is, is it going to deal well with small numbers? 0.1. Uh, okay, that's interesting because it's decided to change it to thousands. Uh, 0 0.001 has decided to change it to years during the Holocene era. Um, 100 years. One year ago during the Anthropocene. Well, it's, zero is now. Um, so we've got some interesting stuff in there. Um, what what was it? Minus 10, minus 10 million years ago? Might be the future. Hey, uh, minus 100 million years ago. Might be the post-Earth era. Uh, well, let's try to put in lots and lots of zeros. 1e plus 34 million years ago was during the nothing era. And my cursor's moved. Well, that's interesting. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of things here. One, I've got something that's not dealt with. And then I've got 1E34, which is a way that you type things in. And then it looks like that's treating it differently. Let's get 1E minus 1E32. Might be the big freeze. Okay. Minus 1E20. Okay, so that's where it's starting to change between that exponential approach and not uh, minus 1 e 25 okay minus 1 e 22 minus 1 e 20 not a number we're starting to find an awful lot of things that are unexpected because we're pushing towards the edges although we've got this thing here which is relatively limited we're pushing out to find, well, firstly, it doesn't deal well with small numbers. Secondly, it doesn't deal well with large numbers. Thirdly, it changes between years ago and years in the future. It seems to have a whole bunch of data that you can't access using the uh, slider. Um, and it also makes an arbitrary uh, change somewhere around 10 to the 10 to the 20, 21. So minus 1e20 looks like that, minus 1e21 in how it represents numbers. Some of those things are put in in the code, some of those things are not. And we can find all that by exploring. But a piece of me wonders why I bother. Um, let me take hold of a thing called file juicer. Uh, there we are, this file juicer. And I'm going to grab hold of the Swift file, that's the, so put that in there, that's now going to juice the million years, and that's what the juicer comes up with. Now the juicer has extracted all the text. Um, let's open this, and we'll open it with TextMate, because that's handy. Oh dear, there we are, TextMate. The TextMate's got a whole bunch of things here. It's got some stuff about fonts, and this is what's in the code. It's not got the code, it's got stuff that's in the code. And look, down here we've got, here are some various stuff. So we, we, we saw that we, Proterozoic, you remember that, um, and we've got pre-solar system planet formation, Hadean, Archaean, Proterozoic, Paleozoic, Triassic, Jurassic, Pelagian, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, Holocene, Anthropocene, future, the post-Earth era, the big freeze, um, and up here we've got the it's my birthday. Well, okay, so there's an Easter egg hidden in here somewhere to say, um, well, well, you've clearly put in a date that it's your birthday. What have we done here? We've gone a long way beyond simply using the thing as it was meant to be used. We're not using this tool as it was meant, uh, this 
um, silly little millionaires thing as it was perhaps intended to be used, we've gone beyond that. We've gone beyond it by um, trying numbers that it was never meant to cope with. We've been giving it numbers that the slider can't generate, that it can't cope with, and then we've thought, well, what the hell, and we've gone in fast into the artifact itself, and we've seen, well, perhaps there's a surprise lying in wait for us that we couldn't find with these searching approaches, uh, because it seems to have a message saying, it's my birthday. Did you find that? I expect that some of you found some of that. I hope that others of you found things like the it's my birthday or that um, once you get up above 10 to the 20. Oddly enough, I've previously seen it work quite happily with 10 to the 64. I'm going to show you something else uh, that we've not tried yet. Let me just grab hold of a whole bunch of zeros there. Copy paste. Mm -hmm. Pasting a lot of those in. Control, uh, copy, paste, paste. Ah, now, something funny is happening here. What's happening there? Now I'm breaking the input. Somehow, I'm making this so that it, the input is now broken. Now, <coughs> that came as a surprise to me because I thought that had been fixed many players ago. Um, and it might not happen on your machines. But this is a surprise that tells us about what the actual artifact is doing. It's not been written to do this. It's not been, it was written, not that we knew, to say it's my birthday under some circumstance, which we've not found yet. Um, but it certainly wasn't written to do that. I suspect it wasn't written to fail as it processes. And, in, oh, there we are, infinity million years ago was during the nothing era. And again, it's moved the curse to the middle. Uh, we've taken a diverse set of approaches to what can be done with this simple slider input box, text input box. We've tried moving the slider, we've tried putting text in as expected, we've tried putting text in that is too large in terms of meaningfully large, we've tried putting text in that is too large in terms of it's more than meaningfully large, it trashes the, it trashes the input box. <coughs> each of those is a different and diverse technique. Each of those perhaps is easier to find a bug, um, gives you something that's perhaps easier to find, looking through the text files, trying large numbers, trying small numbers, trying very large inputs. But if you don't, although those bugs are relatively simple to surface on their own, if you don't try the diverse techniques out, you certainly won't find those. Some of you are still expecting me to produce a list of principles and give you lots of principles and ideas. Um, I will do that, and I'm going to do it in fairly short order. Uh, first thing that I'd like you to remember, please, is that testing is about triggering and about observing. You design your tests, perhaps, to trigger interesting things, or you find an environment that might trigger interesting behaviours. But that's not only what you do. You observe, and you observe in lots of different ways. Uh, observing is still a scientific thing to do. There are many cosmologists, and very few cosmologists, who have their own star to play with. So, work on triggering, work on observing, work in the diversity of those two things. Also remember that if you were to take an analogy with uh, other explorers, you'd find that they use things like Jeeps, and GPSs, and satellites, and guides, and insider information. Don't imagine that because you've got your hands on a keyboard and your eyes on a screen and your brain engaged with what the software is doing, that you're simply doing great exploration. You need tools to be swift and to be strong. Get hold of all the tools you can. If we're looking at different ways of thinking about the system to find surprises, ways to work through, well, let me go through this list. Uh, you could look for various internal inconsistencies. You can see that two things are different. Why are they different? What's different? Is the fact that there is a difference a bug? If you've got two things that are meant to be identical, you know what the bug is. You may not know where it is, but you know what the bug is. Uh, perhaps there's an inconsistency with what you might expect culturally. Maybe you think that something should work in a particular way and it doesn't work in that way. That's probably going to be a bug. It might be harder to defend. But either you need to change your expectations or 
there's a problem there. Perhaps there is a specification that it's inconsistent with. Maybe it's inconsistent with other external models. Look out for all those different kinds of expectations. Look out for things that are missing. Look out for things that are extra. Work through continuous ranges with a binary search. Dividing it into half every time gives you a swift way to, to concentrate down onto individual things. You'll find that things like boundary value analysis are actually white box problems. They're where you get given the boundaries. Sometimes as an explorer you've got to work through and find the boundaries. Don't forget to open the logs. Go into your system, look for various logs. Don't leave it at the logs. Also look out for the debugger. Work with the debugger to give you information about what is actually going on inside the system that you're trying to test. Work out what it's thinking. Don't muck around with um, just working out what the system does. Take it to its edges by attacking it. If you work through a system and attack it and find out that it does unusual things at the edges of its capability, you've still found something true out about the system. It's up to you to work out whether that's relevant to the use of the system, whether you predict whether that's the predicted use or perhaps offensive use. But you've still worked out something true about the system if you attack it. Um, there are different ways you can slice a system up. Um, you can look at the code, you can look at the configuration, you can look at the data, the transactions, the environments, the logs. For goodness sake, remember that testing works in an environment of other tests. You're not just testing in a vacuum. There are tests that come before the sort of stuff we do and tests that perhaps go after it as well. Read the existing tests, run them if you can, particularly if they're confirmatory. They tell you what is expected. They give you an idea of what you can trust and perhaps what you can't, what has been dealt with and what has been left to one side. Get in there and mess around with time. Computers work very fast and are very patient. They work on very different time scales from humans. Speed up your systems, slow them down, give, your, give yourself the chance to perceive something that otherwise the computer might do. Collect pathologies as much as you can. Work out what the problems are to do with the technologies. Work out how you can dig into those pathologies, how you can work around the protections that are there, and you'll find ways into your system. Known faults and common faults aren't just useful to you, they're useful to the end users of the system, and they're useful to the designers to get around those known common faults. Collect and replay pathologies. I'm not the only person who talks about this by any means and indeed I'm going to recommend to you that you go out and if you've not done so already you get hold of Elizabeth Hendrickson's book Explore It which is specifically about finding surprises in software systems. That's Elizabeth Hendrickson's book Explore It. You can buy James Whitaker's books uh, the various how to break software books are excellent clues about how to attack software and how to exploit it and take it into unusual areas. You should, I'm sure, want to know about Bach's heuristic test strategy, which gives you many lists of ideas and thoughts you could have to work through, and Ricard Edgren's little black book of test design, which is like the heuristic test strategy, but fatter and clearer. So there's a whole bunch of different things that you can try. I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to give you that list in any greater detail, but we might go and look at perhaps some more specific things. I think visualization is fascinating. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to take you to an essay that uh, a gentleman called Brett Victor wrote about abstraction and about the levels of abstraction. What he's doing here is he's looking at algorithms for driving along a road um, and he says well this is my algorithm as I move along the road I'll turn my car by two degrees and that shows me what this thing will do now he goes beyond that and I think we need to do this as testers he says well you know actually that algorithm is something which we, we can compute a whole bunch of stuff so rather than just by saying let's move it by two um, I can move it by five uh, degrees. Now that's maybe got a better fit. But there I am. Now I can say this is where my car would have been if my algorithm had moved by that amount. Then it means you can draw a plot. Here is a plot of all the different uh, of the different lines that that car would take in different circumstances. I think as testers we need to start testing like this. We need bulk tools that help us arrive at 
plots and trends. Here we've got something where, again, we've got all these different things, and then we've got something where we can animate the car along. You can see where the car is in relationship to its track. We move down because, of course, we don't have to stop there. We can say, show me more. Um, show me all the different things that it could do all together. Show me what it can do with various different bends. So if I change the bend of the road and keep the car thing, keep the car algorithm the same, what does that do to my plot? Then you can combine all of those things. You can say here we have uh, a bunch of different kinds of things that are going on, a bunch of different algorithms, different different road angles. These are all the different tracks you can make, and so much, so far, so good. This is where it gets interesting to me as a tester. What Brett Victor has put together here is a sum of, is, is a depiction of all the different combinations of road angle and algorithm angle, and the plot here goes from um, something that swiftly tracks the road, <coughs> or tracks the road <coughs> to a reasonable extent, to things that go way out of shape and you start to look at it and you start to see patterns you start to wonder why this here is so slow and this here a bit faster well what why are these things why do they arise maybe that looks like a successful uh, a successful algorithm if all you've got is around here and I think as testers we need to be doing this we need to start putting together our bulk tools not simply to say let's try some performance testing but to do some more functional testing uh, with algorithms, with things that seek and search. And I think that this is what quite a lot of test results are going to start to look like. We're going to start to have things where we develop um, some a, a collection of linked experiments, and that collection of linked experiments itself shows us what's going on in a more maybe visual or intuitive way perhaps but certainly in a more aggregate way the idea for me of one test one result uh, cannot help us in our search for surprises and why are abstraction and visualization interesting well it's because we live in that complex world we're starting to see not only testing is a wicked problem but also that we are starting to get a bunch of emergent behaviours. What do I mean by those two terms? Well, here's a picture of a street in London that I've borrowed from the BBC, and it shows a hotspot. That hotspot is created by a building that acts as a lens. The collective action of the building is to focus light on a specific point in the street. Apparently that's hot enough to melt a car. Believe that if you will. Um, that's an emergent behaviour. It's a, it's a property of the system as a whole. It's an unexpected but true property that a system has. Now, we have already operated in a world where testing is a wicked problem. Uh, a, a wicked problem is something that one that systems thinkers define some problems as. A problem is wicked if we don't understand the solution until we've found it, if we don't know when to stop working on it, if cause and effect are hard to separate, uh, and if we don't have a bunch of things that we can do to a problem where we can be fairly sure we'll get to a solution in the end. Testing is a wicked problem. Problems like find a bug or list a bug, or indeed how do we list all the bugs, are wicked problems. We live in a world now where we're starting to connect more and more things together and we're seeing more and more effects of that vast connection. Uh, over the last month or so we've seen a bunch of stock exchanges go down, we've seen Apple's developer services go down, we've seen Amazon go down. Now those are all probably coincidental but partly they're related to um, the complexity of the systems underneath them. Have a look at what Jaron Lanier is talking about if you want to know more. Um, it's not just the interconnectedness and the vastness of modern systems, it's also the kind of programming we're doing. We're not necessarily programming our algorithms to be distinct algorithms. We're asking our algorithms to learn or to genetically grow. We're starting to not understand why something works, but that something works. And that leaves us with the shepherd's problem. What happens when your sheepdog starts to kill the sheep? 
we need to start spotting emergent behaviours. We need to get good at it. And I think that by doing large tests, by abstracting those results, by visualising those, we can start to dig in in a way that we've not dug in before. But we're going to have to come up with a whole bunch of new techniques because right now is one of the most exciting, most interesting times to be in testing, particularly in the kind of testing which I like to be in, which is finding surprises. I am looking forward to digging deeper and deeper into modern systems and into interesting effects that work in, in between them and into what learning and genetic algorithms do as they grow up, as we start to rely on them. We already know the vast amount of world trades are based on automated systems, automated systems that we don't understand, working within a system that clearly we don't understand. We're trying to find out what that does, what the truth of the system is. That for me is why it's so interesting to be a tester and so important to be a good tester right now. So my name's James Lindsay. If you want more, uh, there are my contact details. You can have a chat with me uh, over the next short while on Twitter or indeed at any time you like via email. Uh, Eurostar will probably have set up some kind of interchange system. I really look forward to talking with you and to finding out your ideas and exchanging information and conclusions. Um, it's been a strange pleasure recording this webinar, um, but... I'm looking forward to talking with you rather more. Thank you very much for listening to this and sitting through all of it, especially the boring bit in the middle. Cheers. Goodbye.